Luke, thanks so much for joining me. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me, first of all, what was it that got you involved in philanthropy? Yeah, so for me, it started quite young. It was when I was a kid, uh, probably about eight years old or so. I was just really shocked to find out that there were kids who were my age, uh, living in other parts of the world who didn't have the same privileges that I had, that you know they were often going hungry or you know suffering from preventable diseases. And that felt very unfair and it felt... Uh, like quite a tragedy and I therefore got involved in things as a child, things like 40 hour famine with World Vision, uh, around the millennium, things like make poverty history campaigning and things like that. And then when I got to a point where I actually had some income of my own, uh, more than just a paper run and stuff, which I was also giving from and my parents were quite encouraging of that. Um, when I actually had some reasonable income and went from having a very kind of low income situation where I was supporting uh, my now wife uh, on, on one income that was quite low. And then suddenly she got a job and I got a promotion. Uh, I was aware that that's a time when your spending might start to increase. And we've kind of been quite happy figuring out how to live on you know less than many of our peers. We didn't want to just like suddenly let that expenditure rise. And so that's when I started to give a meaningful portion of my income. And when you start to give a pretty decent amount, um, you start to care a lot about where it goes. Um, and because you, you go, well, you know, this is the difference between maybe us going back uh, to visit family in Canada more often. Um, that's not a small sacrifice sometimes, or it's a difference between owning a car or not. You know? um, and you go, well, if if this is something that means a lot to me and I am going to make some kind of material sacrifice myself, I really want to make sure that it's actually helping. And so that's when I discovered the work of Giving What We Can, which I now work at, and another organization called GiveWell uh, a bit over a decade ago now. Uh, so yeah, that was how I got into this. Now, as you got involved in philanthropy, I know you identified problems with the way it works. What were some of the things that really struck you as you got to learn more about it? Yeah, one of the things that I think was most impactful for me to see quite early on was a few examples of it just not working as intended. Um, and that also when, when it was looked into, just how wide the distribution of impact could be. I think one of the biggest uh, kind of aha moments for me was seeing data from uh, the DCP3, which is uh, a data set that the World Bank gathered on uh, global health interventions, not just charity, but like public health as well. But just looking at, if you look at a particular area, like helping uh, people uh, with health who are in the world's poorest regions, you look at the data, you kind of order it up from uh, least uh, impact per dollar to highest impact per, per dollar. And at the first pass of the data, you see kind of the median to the uh, most effective, you're getting uh, multiples of about a hundredfold uh, more cost effectiveness. And then on the other end, uh, from the median to the, the least cost effective, you're getting a similar hundredfold ratio. Um, and then there were least obviously cost things, effective. Yeah, obviously things that didn't work as well, things that actively did harm or- And some things, yeah. some things actually, <laughs> some things actually not only don't work, but they're counterproductive. Yeah, right? um, and that was just really shocking. And then you kind of get this moment of like, I don't want that to stop me being generous and, and trying to help people and especially knowing just how much further money can go to others once you get to a certain point in life. Um, but you you'd also don't want to waste it. And so trying to seek out those really high impact opportunities became pretty important to me and, uh, and also found that that was important to other people as well. And so fortunately, I could benefit from how, how common is it? I think people might be shocked based on you know, what yeah. I know about this. How common is it from your point of view, for charities to be not very effective or not effective at all? Yeah, it's hard to tell because uh, there is kind of not great data on this because there are just million, there are literally, I think, close to 2 million charities in the US alone. And so studying uh, the impact of that is quite difficult. But in global developments, some studies indicate that something like 60 to 70% of interventions fail to show a positive result. Um, so either there's kind of negligible or it's insignificant enough that it's hard to actually tell if it is positive. And that when you look in particular areas, you find the distribution is quite wide. So uh, it is just something you can't be confident going into most things you give to that it's going to actually have the impact you'd like. 
And even, you know, I think there is some uh, reasonable argument to be willing for things to not always pay off, to kind of think a bit like a startup investor, that some things will work and some things won't. And some, but if Interesting you're taking point, that approach- you know, to, to just yeah. inter- I'm sorry to, I'm yeah. sorry to inter- interject. First of all, just to highlight 60 to 70%, yeah. <laughs> as you say, there's not very good, there's not comprehensive data, but yeah. as an indication, possibly 60 to 70%. Yeah. Uh, which could be very demoralizing. Yeah. Then on the other hand, but on the other hand, I think you see it as an opportunity, yeah. right? An opportunity for improvement. Uh, and then on the other hand, in the Silicon Valley world, for example, it's roughly, you know, one out of 10 yeah. uh, venture investments are expected to succeed, yeah. but they're expected to succeed really big. But when the, you at least have reasonable metrics of success, um, look, profit isn't everything, but with a company, it's pretty key to know that like, is it generating profit? Is it profitable? Is it something that consumers are willing to pay for um, and investors see a return on? But in the charitable sector, there isn't this feedback loop in a lot of cases. So I think an example for me is if I go to the coffee shop and I spend $5 for a coffee um, and then I come back the next day and I spend $5 and they don't give me a coffee, or I spend $5 and they say, okay, you need to cough up another $4,995 because it's gone up a yeah, thousand fold in price. Um, or, you know, I, I pay them $5 for a co- co- coffee and they you know, punch me in the face or whatever. <laughs> like, um, I, would, I would not go back to that cafe. Um, you kind of have that feedback loop of there's some kind of sensitivity to, I am benefiting from this and I'm paying for this. But in the charitable sector, the person who is benefiting uh, isn't the person who is paying for it. And so the person is paying for it. They're often the information that they have in most cases is marketing. Um, and I've worked in marketing for a big chunk of my career. And um, when you're selling something that uh, the person who is benefiting from it is paying for it, you might play it up in value to some extent, or you might try and focus it. But at the end of the day, if they're not getting the value, you've lost a customer and that was a very bad thing to sell them. Uh, but in the charitable sector, it is very easy for funding to keep coming in while the impact isn't being had. Right. So this is the problem of incentives, right? And and I know, I mean, based on my own experience, when I first got involved in nonprofit work and political work, I was really naive. I see myself as very naive in retrospect, like a lot of people of a kind of a technocratic bent. You know, you tend to assume uh, especially if you've worked in Silicon Valley, as I have, for example, and as a, you know, a, a lot of people getting involved in, in charity now do, you tend to assume that everybody agrees we should do the thing that works best. And so you find out what's, what's the best idea, test it and do that without realizing that you're dealing with a much simpler problem space, really, you know, as genius, as much of a genius as you might think of yourself to be as a Silicon Valley founder, for example, um, you might not realize how simple what you're doing, as hard as it is, is compared to trying to do what you're describing. And there's this fiendish sometimes problem of incentives, right? Because as you say, the customer is not the person who's paying for the service. The person who needs the service very often, of course, can't pay for it. Somebody else is paying for it, like a donor, a foundation, a government, whatever. And immediately you have distorted incentives, because if somebody's offering a charity a ton of money, for example, that'll distort their incentives to please the donor instead of do what would be most effective for the recipient of the service, which might involve putting the charity out of business, right? If it succeeds very well, (laughs) unlike a company, the greatest measure of success would be going out of business. I know. So (laughs) I can relate to what you're saying. So for... um, How did you... So how do you solve that that kind of problem? Uh, How does what the giving what we can approach and the Effective Ventures Foundation approach differ from what's tended to happen, which seems to work sometimes, but not even maybe most of the time. Yeah, so it is a really gnarly problem to just start off with recognizing that. Um, the What it really helps is actually having good information and at least starting to focus on the beneficiary groups where you're most likely to have a large impact because there's just so many things you could possibly do. And so for us, a lot of that actually comes, a lot of the power comes from things like uh, really interrogating your values and going, do I care about something, uh, you know, for you know, any particular reason? And what is that actually that core reason? I'll, I'll use a personal example myself. So I lost my grandmother a few years ago to breast cancer and that is something, it was really 
really tough to see her go through it. Um, and it was tough for the family to lose a loved one. Um, seeing someone you love suffer is never, never a good time. And um, it breaks your heart and you're often driven to do something. And there are a lot of things immediately in front of me, literally in the waiting rooms, I'd see posters on the, you know, for things like brightening someone's day by, you know, bringing them some flowers uh, and that being something that you, you could donate to do and things like that, let alone things like, you know, conducting research to, you know, prevent future cases or improve treatments and things like that. But when I interrogate my values, the first thing I realize is that what I care about is not specifically breast cancer or cancers in general or things that affect people in rich countries like the country that I'm in, but I cared about preventing the suffering of you, know, uh, someone who was suffering and someone who I, I cared about, but also other people care about other people as well. And we're all capable of suffering um, and capable of having wonderful lives as well. So like having more of the good and less of the bad and preventing the loss of a loved one. Um, I lost a loved one and wouldn't want to prevent that happening from others as much as possible. And so once you have this kind of impartial view where you're not necessarily focused on just one particular intervention, uh, you can find things that help uh, where the outcomes are a lot better anywhere on earth or any you know, given species, or you can have time delays and things like that as well. For example, a lot of the most preventative, uh, a lot of the most affected things are preventative uh, things. It's a lot easier to have a lot of impact if you're trying to stop uh, bad things from happening than it is to come and try and fix things once they've happened. We've seen this with medicine, for example. Preventative medicine is time and time and again shown to be much more effective than trying to come in later and, and solve something. And so you can look to good data sources once you have focused on this uh, beneficiary group. There are fantastic organizations out there doing this evaluation work, which didn't exist you know, a little over 10 years ago when we first started looking into this, but it does exist now. Organizations like GiveWell, who do work in global health and development, Founders Pledge work across a number of areas, including climate change, global health, global catastrophic risks. We work in another organization called Longview Philanthropy. They look at emerging risks that you know, could affect all of civilization, um, things like nuclear war, pandemics, and things like that, that if we can prevent the bad things from happening, uh, whether it's giving someone a bed net to stop them from getting malaria, which can, you know, prevent them going to school, they could also die from it, they could not go to work, they could lose a loved one. Um, similarly, if you can prevent something like COVID or even worse from happening by having good measures in place early on, that's where you can get that impact, is thinking about what are the big problems that we can solve? What are the things that people are really ignoring? Um, and what is there things, you know, what are the things that there are some evidence for that you can actually have that really big impact? and focusing on the outcomes, what that's, actually happens I think, in the world. That's, I think, a, a fascinating and important point you just made by starting with interrogating your own values and proceeding from there to data. Because one of the knocks on what's often called the effective altruism movement, you know, of which your organization is a founding part, is that it's so data-driven, you know, and it misses the human element potentially. And it's a bunch of sort of smart technocrats coming in from the outside with a bunch of data and figuring that all that matters is data. Or it's business executives who only understand everything in terms of the business world's view of effectiveness, which is always measurable pretty much. Um, but what you started out with was starting with your values and, and from that start moving to looking for what's the data that would most effectively help you most effectively realize your values, yeah. right? Um, I think that's part of what's fascinating about this is, um, without going too much into the, the weeds about it, is that this movement has roots in philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, moral philosophy through Peter Singer, for example, and, and, and Toby Ord. And these are issues that people, you know, who study philosophy uh, will be familiar with and fascinated by, but the average person doesn't have to or certainly isn't exposed to much about moral philosophy in the course of an ordinary school career. But what you're describing is a key issue of moral philosophy, right? Is how do you, what is virtue, for example? Mm. Is virtue me trying to save my beloved grandmother or, you know, or trying to make essentially, you know, deal with the grief I feel over the loss of somebody I love a lot? Or is it from that feeling, trying to find what could I do that would be truly effective, which might not, as you say, necessarily be to address the problem that took 
your grandmother away from you. Can you say a little bit more about that that perspective wrestling with these issues of moral philosophy? Yeah. Yeah, so there are things that I think uh, many moral philosophers uh, see that like we have some degree of special obligation to people around us. Like, you know, we're expecting uh, a little baby boy in March and I will have different obligations to you know, <laughs> my child as I would to the neighbor's kids. Um, and as I would to kids, you know, living on the other side of the planet, but how much you kind of speaking of Peter Singer, how wide your moral circle is, I think is a really important consideration because when I really consider, you know, a, a kid in Australia who lives on the other side of the country, well, they're actually, if ge geography is part of it, the fact that they're a you know, member of the same nationality as me is, uh, not necessarily that important to me. Um, yeah, and when it doesn't really mean that they are of any higher moral value, that their suffering or flourishing is worth any more or less. Obviously, when it comes to having my child or my partner or your family, I have high levels of knowledge about their needs. And, I, and they're like, if I don't help them, there are like many cases where other people won't. So there's a, there is that kind of special relationship that you have. But once you are getting further than just, you know, something that you do have a lot of control or special obligations to, uh, it does actually give you this opportunity to go, what is the thing that I truly care about? Um, and you know, that's where things like thinking about, you know, not necessarily a specific disease or a specific population, but the types of things that you want to see in the world uh, often are actually much more core things like suffering is bad <laughs> and good lives are good. And, um, and also when you actually deal with some of these questions like uh, time or location or species, you can really push some of our intuitions a bit and where people end up is very different. Uh, but I think it's a good kind of healthy, uh, responsible human thing to do is to actually challenge yourself on where you land. Like, are you doing things uh, for good reasons or are you doing them just because you haven't thought about it? And for me, that's led to, you know, uh, being willing to like open that up a bit and go, okay, well, who, who do I care about helping? Um, and that can actually be a lot bigger than I would have thought if I'd just kind of gone with my, my defaults. Um, and, you know, for example, if you look at philanthropy in the US, 97 or so percent, I think it was the number is on helping people, uh, in the US. Um, yet the US is one of the richest countries on earth. And, uh, if you look at what money buys, uh, you can buy a lot more in, in life improvements and life saving interventions in other countries than you can in the US. Um, and if you're willing to say, Hey, do I value someone's life more just because they're in the same country? Well, or even if you do, how much more is it a hundred times more, <laughs> um, you know, being willing to wrestle with that can give you a bit of an edge. If you're thinking about an investor's mindset, like if you're trying to invest in good, you can get that edge by investing abroad. Um, similarly, if you look at philanthropy that helps animals again, about only a, a couple of percent, I think between one and 3% actually goes to helping animals at all. And of that, the amount that goes towards hel helping farmed or wild animals is about again, one to 3% as well. So you're looking at a fraction of a fraction of a percent going to help uh, the number of animals, which far dominates the humans on this planet and who are being negatively affected due to our actions. Um, and so if you're willing to kind of wrestle with the core questions of who do I care about and what do I care about? And uh, that can actually give you this opportunity to have outcomes you couldn't really have imagined. And, you know, and in moral terms, very often, I think one of the risks of giving, or frankly, any activity you take to be moral, is that it can obscure the self-interest that's at work, even though, even with the best intentions, you, you know, yeah. you're convinced you have the best intentions, but some of this self-examination and self-awareness you're describing can reveal to you that you have unconsciously been moving in a direction that's not necessarily as altruistic as you thought it was. So, for example, even in the United States, um, you look at a lot of the giving and it's people who have done very well. And so they give a ton of money to their alma mater, you know, that they graduated from. And very often it's a place like Harvard or Stanford or somewhere that really does not need the money. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> not to say, you know, nobody should ever donate to Stanford. I've, you know, I've family connections to Stanford <laughs> through people who've gone there and it's a, it's a wonderful place. Uh, same with Harvard, but, um, you know, you get my point or, you know, it's, it could be any pet concern, which it turns out really, you know, you have to ask yourself just how altruistic am I being here? And so again, when you, when you pursue information as you're describing, I think you can see it as not just turning everything into maximum efficiency and technocracy necessarily, but a, a path to awareness, to actually do something that amounts to, you know, the, the enactment of love, but in a way that yeah. is more effective and, and more aware. And it's, I think it's about putting yourself in the shoes of others. So if I lived in a much poorer country, what would I hope that someone who lived in a rich country like Australia would do? Would I hope that they, you know, do things which are directly relevant to them that improve their lives by a marginal amount? Or would I hope that that person who could potentially in impact an entire community somewhere else did that? Um, similarly, like if the way that we treat animals, um, you know, we wouldn't stand by and let humans treat each other that way. Certainly no one that we would love. Um, and I think that, you know, so another thing looking at things like future generations, like I think about my kid and at some point, hopefully they might have grandkids as well. And I would care about their life uh, just as much as I care about my own and <laughs> more in fact, um, and the lives of their friends and everyone around them. But we're doing things today that uh gonna affect their lives whether it's you know the amount of nuclear <laughs> warheads that are sitting there trigger ready or the you know what we're doing in, in terms of the way we're treating the planet and the ecosystem that they're going to grow up in um the decisions we're making now are going to affect them and if i could go back in time and change things that my grandparents generation did that have affected what we ha have today i would and so that kind of like putting yourself in the shoes of others and going if I can like push that out a bit further, what would I hope that someone would do if I was in that position? And and that leads me to um, you know one of the other ethical challenges that's been raised by critics of this kind of approach is sure it's great that you're measuring effectiveness, but doesn't the very fact that individual donors or individual organizations get to decide based on that measurement of effectiveness where the money goes? Is that really right? The Gates Foundation, you know, is often cited as having a larger budget than many countries. And there's relatively few people running the Gates Foundation, ultimately. Um, I mean, really, when it comes down to it, it's two or three, right? So um, should they have that much influence, no, no matter how good their intentions are? How do you respond to that kind of challenge? Yeah, I think it is really challenging. Um, but I think that we have to be kind of pragmatic and think about, well, how does the world work right now? And what are we, what kind of the conditions that we're playing in? And so, and what would you otherwise do? <laughs> so a few things there, like one is, would you rather that, um, you know, the Gates Foundation be focused on something that was, so like a lot of their work is helping, uh, you know, people who have the least in the world. And so like, that's already, they're off to a good start. And they've also decided that they're not gonna hoard that money or, and put it into uh, unproductive assets, like you know, uh, owning a lot of land in the US or something like that. They're putting it into, they're giving it away to start with. So that's, a, that's something I like endorse the giving away that wealth. People may have different questions about how you uh, distribute that. But from someone who again, has a broader perspective of whose lives I consider of moral value, the philanthropic sector fits, uh, like it serves a need that other sectors do not serve. So if you look at governments, governments are set up, again, back to incentives, they're set up in such a way that they serve the powerful within their nation. Um, so those who are voting, at the very least, uh, they distribute that power somewhat by having, you know, every person about the age of 18, maybe who aren't imprisoned or things like that, um, having the right to vote. But that is already excluding people in other countries. And uh, if they had, you know, if you just tax that money and then would have distributed democratically, the first question is who are the constituents? And are the constituents just citizens of the US who show up to vote, which are gonna be typically more, you know, people who already have more power in that country. Certainly, you know, there will be of a certain age group. It's not gonna 
you know, people who are younger, who aren't at voting age, it's not going to include animals, won't include people elsewhere. So, you know, it's not going to necessarily go out and serve those who might need, you know, need those resources the most. Um, so you've got already like, you're not serving the beneficiary groups of people in other countries. You're not serving uh, animals. You're not serving many disenfranchised people within that country. People who might not be able to vote because they're too young or they're in prison or they've got a job which makes it hard to show up and vote. Uh, you're not going to be serving future generations because they're not of voting age <laughs> or, or they haven't been born yet. Um, and similarly with companies, you have people who have, who are shareholders. They, you're incentivized to help to do things that make them happy, customers to a reasonable extent, the team members, uh, people who work at the organization. But if you don't have buying power, if you don't have like, really money is what talks there, um, whether you're a consumer or an investor. So the philanthropic sector is the only sector who's set up to help those who aren't already being helped by the other systems. And so whilst there are things you have to look at in the philanthropic sector about how they go about distributing funds and who has that control. I think that's a really good question. Um, you need to also like realize that it is a sector that is currently filling a really important gap. Now on that, you know, once you get to the fact that you, you know, have this money, which might be controlled by a smaller number of people, I really endorse, uh, a reasonable amount of the Gates Foundation, I think, is actually quite good. I know people who've you know, worked there or are working in there, and a lot of the day-to-day -day decision making power is actually delegated to professionals who care about the problem, who study these problems, and are trying to work at for the sake of the beneficiaries. This is very different to a lot of uh, large donor philanthropy, which is more focused on uh, things that they might be you know, personally affected by or accolades they might get or their alma mater and things like that. So they're already doing a lot better than most. Uh, an organization that I, um, you know, think has done a very good job of this and like uh, cards on the table, they have provided us funding, um, but it's also because they have the same approach <laughs> is open philanthropy. So uh, Dustin Moskowitz, uh, one of the co-founders of Facebook, who runs Asana, he's basically gone and said, hey, I have this money. I don't think that I should be in this position where I have all of this kind of decision-making power. Um, I'm going to find professionals who really care about trying to do as much good as possible. They're going to use tools uh, to try and figure out how to do that. Great data, good research, even moral philosophy to figure out who to help in what way. Uh, they even have this internal trading that goes on between uh, figuring out d different beneficiary groups and how to focus on it. But if you look at all of their grants, almost all of them are helping people who are very different to Dustin Moskowitz. They're not going to help, you know, billionaires. They're not going to help, you know, often even moderately wealthy Americans. Um, and that is something I'd like to see more of, that stepping back and saying, look, I have this huge wealth. I know that you know, net putting into the market or into my local government isn't necessarily going to result in those who need it most getting helped. But I also want to find experts who can really help with this. And then within that, using tools like Open Philanthropy has given a lot to GiveWell uh, and GiveWell uses, uh, works a lot with a uh, the organizations they give to have a lot of people on the ground in the places that they're giving to. And there is this kind of ability for that information to filter back up as to what's working, what's helping and how do people want to be helped. But they also do things like conduct beneficiary surveys, ask them, what would you rather? Would you rather have your know, clean, clean water uh, at this price or this kind of availability in these ways? Or would you rather have this kind of educational outcomes and really involving people in the process of how they're helped? And so I guess, you know, part of what you're saying, an important part of what you're saying, I think, is that an element of what you're contributing here is that discussion and that debate to to raise awareness of that's actually a phrase that drives me crazy in the nonprofit sector, <laughs> frankly, because I think it's so often ineffective to simply raise awareness of a problem. <laughs> but but in this case, to, in a very active sense, um, raise awareness of the issues involved here and to encourage discussion and debate and for people to challenge each other, uh, that too can be, I think, a, a very uh, beneficial effect, perhaps, of this kind of approach. And I suppose, also, if the argument is, you know, democratic governments should be more involved in this uh, perhaps then, or, you know, private billionaires, um, part of what one can contribute to is democratic reform yeah. and, you know, make democratic governments more common and more effective. You yeah. know, that's, I personally think would yeah. be a, probably a valuable thing to, 
to contribute to. Another thing that occurred to me while you were talking was that, you know, you can often flip these moral questions on their head, and we're used to thinking about, you know, the potentially pernicious effects of, of lots of money. But if you think about the charities, for example, that are not effective, there's a moral responsibility there because they're diffusing the impact of well-meaning donors, uh, including small donors very often, who very often don't have access to a lot of great information and are probably quite susceptible to marketing appeals, which will, you know, tug on their emotional responses. And if you're running an, effect, an ineffective charity year after year and siphoning money away from donors, you're diffusing the impact of, of those potential dollars. And I think you should probably be looking at what, you know, perhaps a little more self-awareness about what your real values are. There are some organizations that are just really excellent here. And so one that I like to highlight is an organization called Evidence Action. And uh, one uh, program that they ran uh, was called No Lean Season. And they would help when there was like poor conditions for farming uh, in you know rural communities, uh, they might uh, provide the ability to travel to a city for someone to work you know, to be, earn a bit more and to bring money home and to send money home often during that time as well, uh, to stop their you know, family from suffering just when there aren't good growing conditions. Now, it had really strong early evidence that it was working. Great, they're collecting that evidence. Now, as they scaled it up, they realized that the kind of initial stuff was overly um, optimistic. And, it, you know, you get this either the, the conditions were just like uh, such that it you know, often you find this when things are first studied that like everyone's working really hard to try and make sure it works. But as you try and scale, like not everyone has all of the same skills that might be harder, they might have the same incentives or even just like the data is noisy. So as they scaled it up, it wasn't nearly as cost competitive as they thought. Um, and they had other programs that were more effective. And, more, and so even though it was still helping and it's really hard to shut something down, they shut it down and they're like, hey, you should find out other stuff. Um, or, you know, stuff that we don't do. But because they have this attitude of we keep trying to find the best thing that we can do, um, they're still in the game, uh, at, like, as an organization, because it wasn't just resting on this one program. And I think that that's a really good thing to see in the sector and to be celebrated for, not like how terrible was it that this wasn't as effective as other things or how terrible was it that it didn't work, but good on them for shutting it down. And I think that needs to be celebrated more. Wow, that's that's fantastic. And, you know, it gets back to what I was suggesting earlier, that really success for a nonprofit organization might mean putting yourself out of business. That can't be true of some that are just required to provide ongoing care, you know, of people, for example, who will always need help. And, you know, it's not a problem that can finally be solved. People with, you know, permanent health conditions, for example. Um, but yeah, how do we incentivize organizations to be rewarded essentially for going out of business? I say we can wipe out certain diseases. That's one example. Like, yeah. And I believe actually the March of Dimes in the United States many decades ago, you know, uh, unfortunately there's a risk of it coming back, but I, I think it was polio they were founded to yeah. address and it was close to eradicate it. And so, you know, they, they had to redefine their mission. Yeah. And it's great. So that <laughs> what was, a good problem that to was have. succeeding yourself. <laughs> a wonderful problem to have, succeeding yourself out of business. Now, recently, um, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of attention to this issue in connection with AI, as it happens, because of controversy with um, Sam Bankman-Fried, uh, you know, and, and how his whole operation ended up exploding. But he was coming into it as a prominent, effective altruist. And then you have other um, people in Silicon Valley who, as I mentioned earlier, have been very much attracted to this, or people in the technology business uh, generally. And all those folks tend to come at, not all of them, that's too much of a generalization, but many of them come at it from a utilitarian perspective in, in terms of philosophy, you know, going back to Jeremy Bentham uh, in the 19th century and the idea that you can measure, which is a lot of what you're talking about here, you can measure uh, positive and negative outcomes and morality amounts to trying to generate the most good, you know, and the least bad uh, by every action you take. Um, but that's not the only ethical system, you know, for example, again, not to get too far into the weeds, but there's deontological ethics, which is more, yeah. you know, a code, a moral code, which you must stick by, even if sometimes the outcomes are not good, or virtue ethics, which focuses on the virtue of individual people, which is something that influences a lot of um, 
uh, libertarian thinkers, for example, it's far better to be a heroically good person than to try to rescue everybody else. How how do you look at this, this specifically technocratic slash utilitarian angle here and, and the extent to which that determines how everything gets measured or even the idea that measuring is the way to go? Yeah, I think it's a kind of what is the tool for the job question. So I think that almost every ethical system that I've seen uh, like tends to agree that it is good to do more things that are good. <laughs> um, and so they may have different ideas as to like, where do you lean um, when it comes to some really like deep cruxes? Um, so, you know, at what point might it be okay to do harm for the sake of some good? Uh, but most of the time we're operating in a world where, you know, deontological rule-based thinking works for things like laws and how you treat people around you and things like that. You lean into things like virtue ethics and what is the kind of person that I want to be, the kind of attributes that I want to have. And a lot of the time, these rules or virtues or these other ways of thinking are often in service of things that we might more deeply care about, which is people living good lives. Um, and they're really good tools and rules of thumb. Like if you were to actually try to live purely as a, you know, calculating consequentialist, uh, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning because you wouldn't know if the long-term impacts over all of infinity of choosing one pair of socks over another. What if, you know, th which one might cause you to slip and then, you know, hurt yourself and things like that. Or maybe one of them might be quite attractive and bring you a partner who leads to great fortune or whatever. <laughs> uh, the, the kind of what ifs just get in impossible. And so we need these rules of thumb that work really well. And some people you know, see these things as ultimate truths and that's okay. Like, I think it's perfectly fine for someone to say, look, you know, it's never okay to murder someone by a particular definition. And I think that most people probably think that's okay. You might find these really weird circumstances in some possible future that someone might be in. And that's what we have courts for that. If like, oh, you know, this was manslaughter, but it, you know, had this, you know, positive outcome. And you've even seen people do things that are illegal and you're like, and willing to take the consequences. But the tools for the job, if you're trying to think about things like, how do we allocate resources? You know, that's a really difficult question and trying to understand, well, how does that affect how good lives are? And so, for example, our health systems do this all the time. There's you know, quite a developed field of health economics of if we're going to put one more dollar into the you know, public health budget, where should we put it? And it's always thinking about outcomes. You can debate a lot as like how to trade off these different outcomes, which ones are better or worse. But we're already in the field of talking about outcomes. And so when it comes to philanthropy, there's this big opportunity uh, to play in the game of outcomes that most people tend to ignore. And if you do care about outcomes and there is reasonably good data that you can have much better outcomes than others, uh, investing in those things just seems like a really good deal for a lot of people to be doing, certainly more than currently are. Yeah. And, and I guess really, you know, in a way that introduces, you know, yet another philosophical approach, which is pragmatism. So you, you don't necessarily have to solve uh, some of these potentially insoluble moral philosophical questions if you start from a commitment to do good and try to do more good than harm, then, you know, there are, as you say, there could be a, a deontological code of values like never commit murder or never lie that might serve that. But on the other hand, you know, in the famous example, if the Nazis are at the door asking, where's Anne Frank, uh, do you still want to stick with your deontological code of never lying? Or do you want to say, I don't know who you're talking about? Uh, which takes you into these pragmatic, difficult moral choices, which we seem to be forced to wrestle with, no matter what yeah. clever philosophy we come up with. Yeah. Um, and so that that takes me to something you just you mentioned, which is the famous um, mosquito net solution to malaria, because this is one of the most effective uses of money there is. Right? It constantly tops lists. Of, the, of this kind of intervention, because for a few dollars, you know, you you get people some mosquito nets and you save lives. Yeah. And you save many lives. And yeah. it's hard to find other ways of spending money that are that cost effective. But on the other hand, some things are just naturally 
expensive. For example, if you're trying to rescue people from human trafficking, which is a terrible problem around the world right now, which I assume would be potentially far more expensive, if it was a purely utilitarian consequentialist uh, decision, you would only invest in malaria nets. But obviously that feels morally wrong. Do you have any insights about how we balance that kind of choice? There's a few things in that. So firstly, a classic misunderstanding uh, of what we're prescribing is that there is a small list of things, such as buying bed nets, that everyone should do. Um, and that's just not going to happen overnight. So I, there's no world that I can imagine which er t tomorrow everyone wakes up and goes, you know what? They're right. We're just all going to go get some bed nets and we're going to put all of the current philanthropic do dollars into bed nets. But even if that did happen, that'd be solved within seconds. And so <laughs> then you'd move on to the next thing and eventually you get to the point where, you know, uh, you've probably solved a bunch of problems and something like human trafficking, A, is probably less likely to happen because you've already solved a lot of things that maybe lead to it happening. Things like, you know, terrible poverty, <laughs> like it causes people to do this. Um, and then, even then, like it is reasonable to prioritize. So, like that world isn't going to happen. There are already people who are working on many different things. So, on the margin as a donor, given that there are many people funding all of these different interventions in the world, you as a donor might have more impact if you're willing to think differently. Um, and the other thing is, so that many donors can do is have a portfolio of giving. If you still wanna be like, hey, I wanna have a mix of these things for different reasons. I think it's like, for me, just like the, the story of this or the emotional resonance or it's ha something that happened to someone I care about or I have this special obligation, that can go into someone's portfolio. And I do that personally, like some amount of our philanthropic dollars goes to support the cat shelter that we got our cats from. I see that is that's a kind of a special obligation, uh, but it's not the vast majority of my giving. My vast majority of my giving is going, most people in the world are ignoring these tr you know, tragedies that, that exist that are incredibly ch cheap, relatively speaking. Um, and that every day that they go unfunded, that is really, really a failure of our species. And so I want to at least try and get in there and try and make that problem less bad. And so in a sense, it's triage. It's, you know, I was about 15 years old when I was rushed into the emergency room it, going into anaphylaxis. If I didn't get uh, adrenaline shot and some other things within probably a couple of minutes, I would have been dead. And boy, am I glad that the medical staff there that day didn't say, oh, you know, yeah, there are 30 people in front of you. You're just going to sit down. Uh, we'll get to you eventually. Um, or that they didn't go, uh, the first person in line is actually my brother. Um, I, you know, he's my brother. I should help him. Um, or like there are all of these things that, you know, are kind of analog to what happens in philanthropy uh, that they could be doing in the emergency room. But they do a very responsible and compassionate thing of going, who can we help the most by in what order? Like what are, what order we do we do things to try and leave leave the office today and go that we saved more lives? And not that you ignore things, uh, you go, maybe there are people elsewhere doing other things as well. So if you think back to the emergency room, you know what? I'm not going there for my long-term back issues that I have that I see a physio for and <laughs> things like that. I go elsewhere. And that's kind of like what's happening in philanthropy. But if you have at least some people who are focused on triage, uh, I think you end up saving a lot more lives and making the world a lot better than if you didn't have that. And this gets to part of the service you provide uh, through giving what we can, right? Um, that you actually advise people. Can you say a little bit more about that? You just use terms like portfolio and investment um, as if one were managing you know, a, a stocks, bonds uh, portfolio. But can you say if somebody is inspired listening to what you're saying and says, well, yeah, I, I want to abandon my ad hoc to giving uh, approach to giving and, and, and be more effective. And I could use some advice. What, what sort of advice is available? Yeah. So the advice that we provide is a mix of, we have a lot of information public on our website. Uh, it, we try to do as much as we can publicly. And uh, as to the evaluators and grant makers that we work with, we don't think that 
uh, the just trust us approach is good. <laughs> we want to put the information out there um, and help people, like let people decide for themselves. That being said, if you are impressed with what you see and you think that you know there is a lot of good work behind this, um, you can do things like put money into similar to investments into a fund. So we have things like our global health and well-being fund, where we go, okay, what's the best research being done at the moment? find you know this research partners and we work with them in gra doing grant making um, similarly we have you know funds for helping future generations or animals so if people want a relatively hands-off approach they can just like put money into a fund and then we work really closely with grant makers doing research and trying to make sure that that funding you know goes as far as possible or they can look at you know a bunch of reports that we have on our website about individual organizations stitch it together into a portfolio and you know make a group donation that kind of is allocated between these different things we also do one-on-one -on -one advice as well if people want to talk through some of these things and often the conversations are more like the one that you and i are having is i care about so many things and i'm trying to actually make sense of these trade-offs and that's conversations that are often really worthwhile having with us, we're also with our community, we often organize things like events or some online things that people can discuss with each other as they're wrestling with these questions about, you know, really tough questions, you know, problems in the world. Um, but we do limit our advice to the things that we feel like we can actually really help with and that we see our time as valuable. Um, we have only so many resources as well and we really care, care about impact. So. I'm not going to advise someone on a very customized portfolio that is focused on a lot of things that are outside of our remit, which is like helping the most vulnerable populations with the most effective measures. So if someone is thinking about, you know, maybe a donation to their alma mater or something affected them personally, go for it if you want to add that to, to your portfolio. But I, I'm not going to do a deep dive for, for them as to like how to squeeze the most out of that you know, particular gift. Um, uh, we just don't have the resources for that. And of course, there are, there are organizations and consultants that do provide those customized services if, if people are seeking them. And, and uh, it seems to me that the, the transparency you describe, uh, which presumably everybody involved should be committed to, is a big part of the point. Yeah, and another thing to add on that is that we provide a certain limited amount of advice ourselves but that's often the first point is getting to understand someone's values, where they're trying to head. And if people have above you know, a particular size of gift, generally in the kind of hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's when we are also in a position to introduce them to specialist grant makers. <clears throat> Pardon. So specialist grant makers like GiveWell or Longview Philanthropy, or if they're a startup founder, Founders Pledge, or other kind of smaller niche advisors that we know in our networks who can help people with particular high impact gifts in a very kind of more niche area that is a bit more hands on. So looking at where you've been and where you are now and, and where philanthropy in, in general uh, is and where it was before, how do you feel about the prospects uh, as you look ahead to the future? I'm someone who's, I think, my, my nature is quite optimistic. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> um, I do see a lot of uh, big problems in the world that we're struggling to address uh, and some things on the horizon that I could see going either way. But I kind of have this optimistic attitude that if you have more people who are inspired by people who care about doing good um, and people are working really hard, that's how you solve it and being cynical or pessimistic is kind of guaranteeing a bad result. So even though I might be cautiously optimistic, uh, I am pretty optimistic uh, and that keeps me going and seeing things actually happen is very motivating. So seeing, you know, the last uh, couple of years was a bit tough with COVID and um, a few other things like the Ukraine supply shortages, uh, but seeing for most of the last decade consistent drops in poverty um, has been very motivating. Despite you know the increases in uh, meat consumption and and some of the conditions getting worse in some places, we have seen huge innovations in animal product alternatives and better um, regulation, especially in places like the EU, around how you treat animals. Um, Climate change has been one that, uh, yes, we haven't solved a lot of things, but the progress in the last you know, few years has just been incredible to see. And 
so many things just being just a matter of time as you know renewable costs drop dramatically and things like that um so there are things that i am concerned about uh that i do think we like really have a long way to go um you know uh covid was an example of a test that i think we failed um you know something that we've been worried about for a long time uh, in at giving what we can and in this community is pandemic risks and covid as terrible as it was, uh, is nowhere near as bad as uh, pandemics Pandemics can be if it's much more lethal and has a long in- incubation period and, uh, you know, is much more infectious. Uh, we could see significant, just incredible damage. Um, and we failed in many ways with COVID to show that we could actually step up and, 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 and solve this problem. And not sufficient amount of funding has actually run into you know come into this space since but there are a lot of opportunities uh and if you are able to take those opportunities i think that you know it's a world that i'll be really happy to try and bring up my kids in so hoping to get there (laughs) and i think that uh you know as you folks say on your website as part of your uh, self-description it's helping to build a culture yeah of being effective in giving and in these kinds of interventions will also hopefully play a big role in that. And it seems to me that that is part of what you're describing. Oh like, yeah. You know, whatever progress we're making on climate change is because a lot of people care about making progress on climate change. And I tell you what, the best part of my day, honestly, like often will like have a shivers down the spine or, you know, shed a small tear is reading motivations that people submit when, uh, they sign the giving what we can pledge. So we have a pledge for people to give 10% of lifetime income to high impact charities. We also have other versions that are more flexible than that as well. Uh, But people come to that often quite morally serious and quite challenged by the problems they see in the world, but motivated to do something about that. And people writing down why is just (laughs) such a motivating thing. Um, and uh yeah it's often something that uh it definitely keeps me going so if you don't mind i'm actually just going to read like literally today um someone said i recognize that i give uh, that anything i give away can have a much greater effect on others welfare than it can have on mine and it makes sense that this effect should be as large as possible for any amount given and that was just an hour ago like (laughs) and that Honestly, seeing that pop up on my screen definitely uh, makes this all worthwhile. Oh, that's that's a wonderful story. Thank you so much for for telling it. And uh, I think that you know, as part of building a culture of giving, uh, one of the things that is most persuasive, I think, is that it can actually be seen. The activity of service can actually be seen as something that serves yourself. And and Mm -hmm. it's something that we lose sight of um, in the culture uh, that most of us uh, live in, in in the developed world anyway. Um, Yeah. Where we assume that, you know, pleasure is something you seek for yourself or or those around you. But uh, the act of service is itself deeply pleasurable, which sounds... Can sound naive and Pollyannish, but actually turns out to be true when you just give it a try. And the science is clear. Like, <laughs> this has been looked at many times, and people get a lot more lasting joy from meaningful pursuits that improve the world for others than they do for consumption uh, on themselves that has like a really rapid decay in many cases. Um, you order the next yes, thing on the, Amazon. The hedonic and, treadmill, and, the, the yeah. hedonic treadmill, right? Where you're. You're constantly seeking your own hedonic pleasure, uh, yeah. but you're on a treadmill. You know you have to keep seeking pleasure. You will, uh, as another saying goes, you can never get enough yeah. of what you don't need. That was that was actually one of the things that I read uh, when I told telling you the story of when I first started giving significant amount. It was reading about it was reading the hedonic tr- treadmill and some of the behavioral science and stuff that and psychology around that as well. I was like, man. And I felt it. I felt it personally. Like you get those moments. Uh, I'd be you know, looking at social media or something like that. And you're like, oh, no, if I got that, that'll, you kind of had this like, that'll make me happy. <laughs> um, and, and then 
two weeks later, you're looking around your messy house and going, I've got too much stuff. Now I feel really bad about trying to like throw it out or sell it or <laughs> get. Oh, oh no, I, I, you know, I think all of us are prone to that. All of us in, in any kind of consumer society. And, uh, it, you know, what, what's often been observed too, is that it not only does it fail to bring lasting happiness, but it can actually make you irritable, you know, more likely to be unhappy. It, it seems that the more people get, um, of these kinds of gratifications, the more likely they are to be dissatisfied. Um, yeah, Jose Ortega Gasset, you know, identified this a long time ago that people start to behave in a way like, you know, Renaissance princes or something who can never be pleased. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I th tell you what, it does ca cause you to think about the things that do bring you value. So, for example, like we do a family conspiracy Santa where we all have a WhatsApp thread where we talk about the person who's one person's going to buy a gift. And but we all get to talk, pitch in and talk about what might be valuable to them. And then when they get it, you know, you might be like, oh, we, yeah, we all talked about this. And that kind of it adds that value. And so when you do take a moment and go step away from some of the mindless spending that we do, um, when you do spend on things, you can get more value from it than if you just kind mm -hmm. of didn't stop and think. Um, plus, you right. then often have a bit more to help others as well. <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, one way people might want to consider spending is by going to givingwhatwecan.org and seriously considering taking the uh, giving pledge um, and facing that choice uh, from a point of view of what it might offer you uh, as well as everybody else. Well, Luke, uh, I want to thank you so much for your time today. This has been absolutely fascinating and important, and uh, it's really been a, a, a true pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation and wishing you the best for the rest of the festive season. You too. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.